Uh, here you're at a, a crucial stage, and well, one of two things could possibly happen. One would be that Joe says, oh my God, uh, I'm getting drunker than I meant to be at the wrong times and in the wrong places. Uh, this must be a powerful drug. Uh, I better be very careful about this drug from now on. Uh, in fact, I maybe ought to get myself some education about it. Um, that's a possibility. The other possibility is that uh, Joe will say, you know, I had uh, unintended, I've had instances of unintended uh, intoxication, uh, and I've had blackouts and more blackouts uh, than it, it seems most people have. Um, but you know, I, I heard that happens to everybody. That at one time or another, everybody has a blackout. One time or another, you know, people will worry a little bit about their drinking, and, and that'll pass. And, and so I, I'll, uh, I'll be a little more careful about it next time. Those are different responses, aren't they? And if you listen carefully enough, that second response is an excellent example uh, of denial. Because what he's done with the experience of loss of control is he's minimized it and normalized it. In other words, when you say this happens to everyone, what you're saying is this is normal, okay? And if it's normal, it can't be abnormal, can it? It can't be both normal and abnormal at the same time. So, so Joe has just convinced himself that there's this process that's been happening to him uh, is normal, is locked in denial. And when a uh, process of loss of control is um, met with by denial and rationalization, that's when you, you move from the early stage to the middle stage. Because now you have a problem, loss of control, but you're denying it. So what will you do about it? Nothing. You will keep drinking. Why? Because you've decided it's not a problem. That's why. No one ever solves a problem he doesn't have. Joe doesn't go the other way. Why? Well, drinking hasn't been painful yet, perhaps. Or if it's been painful, it hasn't been painful enough. Or he has escaped some consequences because of friendships or, or because of connections. Um, or because of other enablers have helped him believe that he is not having trouble uh, as a result of his drinking. But it's when loss of control is denied and rationalized, we move to the middle phase. And here's when you, you begin to see um, a system of alibis and rationalizations. You know, why did you drink last weekend? Well, the Ravens won. Why did you drink the weekend before that? The Ravens lost. Why'd you drink before that? It was bye week. <laughs> you know, I heard the Colts won, the Colts lost, the Colts didn't play. Why did you vomit, Krabs? Why'd you vomit the week before, lobster? How about before, shrimp? Mussels, clams, every shellfish known to God and man has been blamed for alcoholic vomiting, except for the one true cause, which is loss of loss of control. Uh, you must be getting some awful shellfish. Uh, why did you drink before that? Well, it was the dog's birthday. <laughs> All bets are off. Now behavior under the influence is completely unpredictable. You're not sure which Joe you'll meet this particular night. It might be happy-go-lucky, fun-loving Joe, or it may be mean as cat shit Joe. You're not sure who's showing up. The effect of alcohol, for a variety of reasons, the liver is begin to, beginning to be infiltrated with toxins and not functioning as well. And so the, the behavior starts to get a little unpredictable. People who, have, who are ordinarily mild-mannered uh, can, can get uh, violent, as a matter of fact. Um, and yet they're not normally uh, that way. We just can't predict it, that, that's all. And if you can't predict what you'll say or do when you're drinking, then you have a problem. The problem is that it's unpredictable. 
That's a problem. That's a problem. You can't predict it. That's a problem. Guilty feelings increase, and of course what Joe does with guilt is drink to make it go away. Why not? He doesn't have a drinking problem. He has a guilt problem. So what's its solution? Alcohol. What caused it? Alcohol. What's its solution? Alcohol. Oh shit. We just started a circle, right? The cause of the problem has now uh, become the solution to that same problem. Uh, there's no way out of that. That's a circle. Every time the guilt happens, it's going to be dealt with the same way. Complaints from family and friends now start to increase. But family members keep their mouths shut, sometimes for an inordinately long time. So they won't say a word. And, and when they start, when family members start complaining out loud, you can almost be sure that this disease has a foothold. Because lots of people, uh, poor old Irish wives, you know, they're long suffering, so they don't complain for the longest goddamn time. There are some men who won't complain because they're ashamed. If they complain, they're ashamed uh, of not, quote, being in control of a situation. So they hold it back for a long time. So when they start saying it out loud, you can almost bet that this is well on its way. The patient is doing lots of relief drinking drinks to relieve guilt, insomnia, anger, resentment, you name it, he does it. Whatever else that relief drinking is, it's not social drinking. That's not drinking in a social setting with other people to um, advance or to help uh, social inter interaction. That's drinking a drug as a drug. <laughs> it's drinking alcohol as if it were a tranquilizer. It's smoking pot as if it were a sleep aid. Okay? I don't care what else you call that. That ain't social. That's using a drug for its properties as a drug. Family problems intensify. Job problems start for some, but not all. There are, uh, Dr. Valiant did a study of symptom types in Boston Blue Collar workers and Harvard graduate alcoholics and Harvard graduate alcoholics didn't have family uh, didn't have job problems. Boston blue collar workers had job problems, but Harvard graduate alcoholics didn't have job problems. They had family problems, but they didn't have job problems. Guess why? <laughs> you know, if you're a Harvard graduate alcoholic, you're usually the boss. And so <laughs> you don't reprimand yourself, much less fire yourself. You drink to sleep. Now that's, that's alcohol as sleeping pill. That's not social use of a social and recreational drug, no matter what you call it, all right? That's medicinal use uh, of a recreational drug. And that's trouble. And of course the reason Joe is drinking to sleep is because he's too agitated to be able to sleep without a, without a depressant drug. And the depressant drug takes the form of Johnny Walker and Jack Daniels. At some point in the history, the Joes of the world will get extravagant uh, with their time or their money or their advice or their help or, or whatever. The motive behind it is an attempt to prove that they couldn't be alcoholic. They couldn't have a drug problem. Because look at all the wonderful things they're doing for other people. Uh, they are helping you move. That's the best time to catch an alcoholic who is in that phase of his illness and you need to move. Grab him then, because he'll move you thousands of miles. He'll move you thousands of miles. Um, he, you know, he proves, he can even go abstinent for periods of time. Some people think this is all one long rush to, to death. It's not. Alcoholics can stop drinking for periods of time. Often that's when they do this kind of stuff. They get extravagant. It's all to prove that they can't be, and they, they get so proud that they've done such a wonderful job to help others that they celebrate it with drinking. Everything becomes a reason to continue. I wish I'd made this one up. I, I, I bet you somebody in AA made it. 
made it up. They say, alcohol, alcoholics are magicians. They can turn anything into a drink. So it, it, at this stage of the game, it almost doesn't matter what happens. If something good happens, what will Joe do? Drink to celebrate it. If something bad happens, what will Joe do? Drink to relieve it. If nothing happens, what will Joe do? Drink because he's bored. <laughs> if lots of things are happening, he'll drink. It doesn't matter. He'll drink because he's stressed. It almost doesn't matter. So if you say to yourself, I'm driving my spouse to drink, the truth is he doesn't need a driver. <laughs> And the way we're going to know that is you'll be dead three days and he'll still be drunk. So we know you're not causing it anymore. You're not alive to, to be able to cause it. It has the force that keeps it continuing. That's called addiction. That, that's called addiction. You know, at some point here, we're going to start calling it just that name. Job performance is affected. For some, not for others, depends. Some people get away with it at the job for a long time. Uh, in fact, you know, m the, the largest proportion of alcoholics in this country are what we call, quote, functioning alcoholics. That means they went to work today. They went to work today, 65%. Uh, agitated in the morning because he's probably been eight hours without a drink, and he's starting to feel the early signs of withdrawal, if he's susceptible. Some people go inordinately a long period of time and never become physically dependent. But Joe is the type who will. So what we'll see from Joe is morning shakes, morning agitation. What do you suppose, now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know the answer to this one. How do you suppose he'll deal with the morning shakes? You'll take a drink. That's why one of the questions that addicts are always asked is, do you drink in the morning? Because the answer is often, if it's yes, it's often because uh, you're feeling withdrawal agitation and you're drinking to solve it. I mean, that's the pattern all along, right? Drinking to solve problems that it caused. Unfortunately, tricky things are now happening with tolerance. Tolerance, the ordinary history for tolerance is that it rises. At some point, it becomes unpredictable. One night, you seem to be able to hold a lot. Two nights later, you get drunk on three beers. Okay? At the end, it starts to reverse. So one of the problems with with uh, diagnosing geriatric alcoholism is that families will tell you grandma is drinking a lot less than she ever used to. And they're right. The problem is grandma is also falling down the stairs more often than she ever used to. So the drinking has reduced, but the problems haven't. The problems are, in fact, more severe. Uh, at this point, um, it's... Tolerance is still uh, growing, and so the amount has to increase uh, because we're fighting the fact that the effect is not increasing, it's decreasing. Thank God, right? Seeks help, but not for drinking. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. Joe's had enough problems that he needs help. And he'll go seek that help. Unfortunately, uh, he won't ask for help from an addiction specialist. He'll go to a doctor and tell the doctor that he's having unusual pains in his stomach, uh, numbness in his fingers, uh, having trouble sleeping. If the doctor isn't wise enough and the patient uh, deceptive enough, uh, he may walk out of the office, the doctor's office, with a prescription for a drug which is identical to the drug that got him into the office in the first place. So an alcoholic will have some peripheral neuropathy, some numbness in his fingers, and he may get a drug that's a tranquilizer because the doctor thinks that's nerves. Or he may walk in saying he's anxious and get a tranquilizer because so he's switched from the wet drug to the dry drug, or he's using both. 
And that's helpful for him because it's helping him maintain his level of tolerance. All right? He's one in one now. One, one drink and one pill doesn't equal two drinks. It equals three drinks because the effect is synergistic. So um, Joe tries some control ploys. He tries some tricks. He wants to keep drinking, uh, but he doesn't want the problems. And so he'll only drink after 6 p.m. He'll stop the hard stuff and s stick with only light wine and beer. Uh, he'll stop drinking in bars and drink only at home. Or the reverse, he'll stop at home and, and drink only in bars because the bar will be too expensive to spend that much money. He'll hide, he'll put it in inconvenient places so it's hard to get to. Uh, and he'd have to get his coat on and go outside and get it out of the trunk of his car. He'll, he'll measure drinks in a graded tumbler. In other words, he's trying all kinds of tricks to drink but not get drunk, all right? If you are attempting uh, half a dozen control ploys, you have a problem. Your problem is you have to use control ploys to control your drinking. It must mean that drinking is out of control. You have to use tricks to try to manage it, you know? Uh, anybody who is trying to control his drinking has a problem. He's having a problem with his drinking. Otherwise, the willpower should just solve it, don't you think? Just say, I'm not going to do it that much anymore. And non-alcoholics, sometimes non-alcoholics will go through a period of time in which, it, in which they drink excessively. Um, and then they wake up and either mature out or decide that that was stupid. I think I won't do that again. These are often short periods of time. Okay. That's what makes this disease tough to, to diagnose. Joe has developed some good resentments. Uh, he can get vividly angry uh, at the fact that his father wouldn't allow him to play football when he was in high school. Didn't want his son to be injured. He gets very angry at the soccer coach who cut him when he didn't think he should be cut. Uh, he's resentful at the educational system for not recognizing his attention deficit disorder. Uh, Joe is pissed off at his wife for not understanding his sexual needs. Uh, <sighs> anger is what you feel right now if I step on your toe. Useful. It'll keep you, it'll tell you to stop stepping on my toe. Resentment is if three weeks later you remember my, you know, my stepping on your toe and you get angry all over again. That's old anger from the past. Okay? Anger can be useful. Sometimes we use it to motivate ourselves. Resentments are useless. Absolutely useless. They have no power. They have no force. When I first heard resentments you know, are part of the picture, I thought, well, that... And that sounds like it's the psychiatric piece. Uh, but the more I listened, the more I talked to people, especially people who had relapses, the more I began to recognize that resentments is not accidental. It's not, oh, and by the way, they're also resentful. Uh, resentments are dynamic. In other words, they play a useful role for an alcoholic, for a drug addict. So if you have a resentment, and you can keep it going, this old anger from the past. What you can do is you can use that resentment both as a reason to keep drinking, right, and someone to blame it on. So it gives you one and the same time uh, a, 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 a reason to continue and somebody to blame the whole process on. Now the way that we come to know that is that people who get sober will sometimes find that are, not all the time, but sometimes find that a resentment that they've had for years goes away. That they don't feel it as intensely anymore. And you'd say, well, why would it go away? Um, that's the question I ask myself. Why, why would this go away? Recognizing that Vernon Johnson said, you know, alcoholics develop the more chronic condition of becoming resentful people. 
that in fact AA has said for years um, that the major cause for a lapse is resentment. Okay, so I start wondering what, what role does this resentment play and why would it in many cases go away? And the answer is, it would go away if it has no purpose anymore. It doesn't have use. So and a resentment that sometimes bothered people for years just starts to dissipate, just starts to go away. Even justified resentments against dead people. We had a patient here, honest to God, she was sitting here in this hospital hallucinating that water was coming through the walls and she was afraid she was going to drown. And we kept assuring her that none of us were drowning and that she probably wasn't going to drown either, that she's having an unusual experience. We know you're not going to understand this, but we are here for you and we have plenty of life rafts. Of course, we don't have lots of life rafts. Um, when she sobered up long enough to realize that she wasn't hallucinating, she talk, started talking about a resentment she had from the time she was 16. 16 years old, her father, a proper Victorian gentleman, this lady's 65 now, her father, a proper Victorian gentleman, refused to pay for her to go to nursing school. It's the only hope, the only career she ever wanted, and he wouldn't pay for it. Asshole. So here she was, sitting at 65 in a hospital, hallucinating, based partly on a father who refused to pay for nursing school, who the man had been dead for 20 years. So she had a justified resentment. Wouldn't you agree? She had a justified resentment against a dead person. Against a dead person. And it was part of what was playing a dynamic role in her addiction. It kept giving her an excuse to drink and somebody to blame. You drink to if you had a father like mine who refused to let you do the only thing you ever wanted to do in life. Okay? She gets sober, of course, and what we'll expect of that is she might need a little extra help because she's had a resentment going on now for 50 years. And she's gotten good at it, all right? So she may need a little extra help with a resentment, but that abstinence alone is in part going to play a role in her recovery, simply because she doesn't have, she doesn't need the old excuse. Some people do have premorbid resentments, need some extra help. Many an addict will find that if you stop drinking, that resentment starts to go away. Joe's withdrawal symptoms are now noticeable. We don't have to guess whether Joe is in withdrawal, we see his hand shake. He picks up a cup of coffee and uh, uh, his hand shakes. He, can't ha he has difficulty picking up an object from the table without knocking it over. Uh, it can be so bad that his eyeballs twitch. Okay. He's increasingly anxious about the supply. Uh, Joe is worried about when he can get it, where he can get it, how much it'll cost, will it be enough, will it last for the weekend, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Early on, he was um, looked forward to drinking. Now he's preoccupied. Now there are three things to do on the weekend, but he can't think of what the other two are. <laughs> he can only think of that one, and that's drinking. Later on, we're going to conclude that Joe is obsessed with drinking. That means he doesn't have three things to do this weekend. There's only one. But that's all he can think of. So this is a progressive disease, keeps getting worse. He hides bottles because he's ashamed of it. At some level, he's starting to recognize that he's lost control. And so his denial system is going to have to ramp up because he can't afford to see that he has a drinking problem because then he'll have to do something about it. So if you're in the way, watch out because you could unwittingly become an enabler that can bait you into starting an argument and then use that argument uh, as an excuse to drink. This isn't social drinking, it's called using the drug 
uh, to sort of prime your pump. You're operating at a subpar level, partly because your par requires alcohol and you've let it drop, so you drink to bring it back up. Golden eye opener sometimes. Um, there are maintenance drinkers. There are some people who, in fact, one of the first people I knew um, who was dealing with alcoholism was a French Canadian who was a maintenance drinker. You would never see um, this guy drunk. His name was Ron. Never see dr Ron drunk. But you'd always see him with alcohol on his breath. And I venture to say that if somebody had taken a blood alcohol level of Ron, they would have found that he was legally intoxicated. In other words, his blood alcohol level was probably above a 0 0.10. So for him, that was walking around drunk. Legally drunk is what he was most of the time. His tolerance, of course, was so great uh, that he, he could withstand that much booze uh, over that period of time uh, without showing signs of it. Okay? Uh, he was a maintenance drinker. He had it everywhere, in his car, in his locker, uh, in his glove compartment, in a, a pair of shoes. You name it, he wasn't terribly far away from a, a drink at any, at any point in his life. Now there are episodes of unpredictable tolerance. He had two drinks the other night and was smashed. His liver is infiltrated, so he's not processing alcohol as he should be processing it. Uh, and he's drinking more potent forms and so he's, his tolerance is wacky. No one can tell how much he'll be able to hold. He drinks alone for, partly for that reason. In other words, partly because he doesn't know how drunk he's going to get on any particular occasion. So now he prefers to not have people witness that. This is sad. This is sad drinking. Because it, it, it's, it's simply, it, it's, it's a form of drug addiction at this stage. You know, you're sitting in a room with a bottle or a needle, and you're dosing and redosing. And it can happen with alcohol as easily as it can happen uh, with heroin. And then, of course, uh, after some antisocial behavior, increasing isolation, there are attempts to stop. The middle stage goes to the advanced stage when that uh, attempt to stop is followed by uh, a bender or a binge. You get to the point where you say, oh my God, I have got to stop, I'm going to stop. Now unfortunately, you're terribly physically dependent, you may have a seizure. So at this stage, no one is advised to stop on their own, they're only advised to do that with the help of a physician who understands addiction and withdrawal. Uh, so if he tries it on himself, it, it could be very risky. When an attempt to stop is successful and he stops for a period of time, it, and once tolerance has developed, uh, tolerance has to have developed, if he starts again and he starts with a bender or a binge, a bender or binge is defined as any period of more than 48 hours or more in which a patient does which an individual does little more than drink, pass out, wake up, drink, fall asleep, wake up, drink. In other words, there are no waking hours in which alcohol isn't consumed. And that may go on for two or more days in a row. Could go on for a week, three weeks, a month, six months, believe it or not. That's, that's incredible that someone would do that. At the chicken farm, he drank it away because he was a binge drinker, and on one occasion kept that up for uh, almost six months. That he'd have fleeting periods of abstinence in the morning, but by afternoon he was drunk again, and he lost the chicken farm. He drank it away. It ain't pretty from now on. There's no way that I can, it's hard to understate this. There are benders and binges. There are outbursts of rage, um, suicidal gestures. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, at this stage, an uh, individual succeeds at committing suicide. 
an ethical breakdown. He's lying and stealing and cheating, che uh, stealing money from his kids, lying to anybody who will believe him at this stage of the game, uh, stealing to uh, get money, to buy booze. Anger, resentments, and paranoia, the patient starts to look more psychiatric, uh, are unreasonable. You say, my God, it, 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 someone who has this much of those kinds of, of issues is terribly sick. Joe suffers deep remorse and guilt. Uh, remorse that soaks in, you know. Uh, actually, the, the, the word remorse comes from the Latin re, again, and mori moriri, which is to die. So it means to die again. He isn't drinking to feel fun or to even, he's drinking to get out of pain, just to feel normal. All right, this is a long way from what we saw at the very beginning. In the same way that a piece of that film showed you that it's a long way that a person travels from the beginning until this point. But it does happen. Tolerance reverses. So now it rises, becomes unpredictable, and then reverses. So you get drunk on very little. Social life decays. Your friends leave you. Your wife leaves you. This is extreme. People don't usually get this bad today because we've learned how to intervene at some point earlier than this. But we're going to pretend that Joe goes the whole distance. There are medical emergencies, attacks of pancreatitis, chronic and recurring accidents, injuries, um, arrests, sometimes the heart stops beating uh, and they're taken to emergency rooms. Uh, withdrawal is pronounced, uh, incoordination of people, even when they haven't had a drink, start to have troubles with, with uh, coordinating. We had, an, we had an old guy come in to treatment and on day one he walked in literally like this. And he hadn't pooped his pants. Okay. His brain had been damaged enough that he had to widen his gait to stay walking. Thirty days later, he walked out like this. And I said to him on, on his way out, I said, oh, you learned to walk while you were here. <laughs> and he looked at me and he laughed and I said, you know all you did while you were here? Uh, and if you did nothing else that this helped you, you didn't t drink alcohol. And in 30 days, that problem, lucky for you, uh, reversed, reversed. Uh, we admitted a woman who had ascites. She looked pregnant. Six months later, at a Christmas party that we usually had here, she looked pretty hot. <laughs> she was no longer pre pregnant, you know. She had given birth to what looked like a 50-pound case of alcoholism. She had what's called ascites. Water fluids had leaked through, the line, through her stomach lining and between the lining of her stomach and the skin. So she looked, it was hard as a brick. She looked pregnant, she wasn't. Uh, memory problems, short-term memory starts to get shot. Uh, you can remember some things that happened 20 years ago, but you can't remember what happened 20 minutes ago. An almost nameless fear and chronic anxiety sense of impending doom, and uh, that's a good grasp of reality because doom is impending at this stage of the game. Now you think you can't get this far. Oh yes you can. Oh yes you can. And your alibi system collapses. If it doesn't collapse, your future is, in the old Towson group in AA they used to say, your future is the group, the grove, what a grave. The group was AA, the grove was Spring Grove, and the grave was, as you would guess. Your future is the group, the grove, or the grave. So what's hitting bottom? Does it happen when you say, I'm an alcoholic? No. I've been an alcoholic for a long time? No, no that's not bottom. Uh, drinking has caused problems? No, that's not bottom. I should stop? No, that's not bottom. I drink too much? No, that's not bottom. 
Life would be better if I didn't drink. No, that's not bottom. I have blackouts. That's not bottom. What's bottom? Well, the way you know it is that uh, your denial system is intended to do uh, a couple of things. Well, one of them is that there are two P's that result from your use of this drug. One is the P that stands for pleasure. You drink and you have pleasure. It, it's a pleasurable experience. The other with addicts is, of course, you drink and, and it's painful. There are painful consequences to your drinking. What denial intends to do uh, is to cause this to happen. And the denial system intends to maximize the pleasure while it minimizes the pain. So even though you have pain, it's not very much pain, and it's worth it. How many times have you heard an active alcoholic in the late stages say, I know it's trouble, but it's worth it? That translates simply as the pleasure exceeds the pain. That's all. Now, bottom happens when you say, this hurts, and that formula reverses. This hurts, and now the pain has started to exceed the pleasure. It ain't worth it. It's too painful. It hurts too much. You do no addict a favor by saving him from the experience of his pain. In fact, you enable him. You help him continue. As long as it's worth it, he's not going to stop drinking. Why? Because it's worth it. It's worth it. So, you got to say first this H word, hurt. It hurts, and then this H word, help. If you say this hurts, but I'll take care of it myself, um, you're claiming that you're going to reverse a disease that took, let's say, 15 years, and by the power of your mind, you're going to reverse that. It's your, it, it, it's your denial it's enabling, it's all that whole process. The process of cellular adaptation and tolerance that has gotten you sick. And to claim that you're going to solve it, you're going to cure it, uh, the odds are against you. Might it happen? Might. Might. Is it likely? I wouldn't bet on it. I wouldn't bet on it that through the power of your mind, you're going to reverse a disease that you've denied for 20 years. And you're going to claim you're going to use your willpower now to reverse that. I don't believe it. I just, I'm not going to bet my money on you. All right? So you got to say help and give up dictating the form that help takes. You can't say, I want help, but only on Tuesdays. I want help, but don't tell me to go to AA. That's the biggest one. I want to dictate the form that help takes. Uh, you got to let go of dictating the help, you know, the form that it takes. You'll go in recovery, you'll go through acute clinical withdrawal. That means you, some of you will have the shakes. If it's cocaine, you'll crash. After the acute period is over, and worst case scenario with the depressant drugs, uh, you'll be out of measurable withdrawal within 30 days, 28 days. So that's all it takes. But within 28 days, no matter how much you've used for how long, and through the use of medication that will help you get through this, which is, of course, a companion drug. You, know, you drink an alcohol, they'll give you Librium. All right? It'll take 28 days, even if you had the worst heroin addiction on the face of the earth. It'll be over in 28 days. But you're not finished because there is a period that you're not, you know, you're not going to have uh, certainly life-threatening withdrawal, but you'll have bothersome withdrawal for a period of time. Uh, some clinicians have said post-acute withdrawal is likely to go on for one month for every year you drank. Dr. Ziegler used to tell her patients that, and her patients would respond with, oh shit, <laughs> one month for every year I drank? That's a long time. And then there's a kind of psychological withdrawal. Because not only have you stopped a drug that kept your uh, your brain in balance, right? You've stopped a drug that gave you some place to go and someone to go with and what to do when you got there. 
So having lost that is a third kind of a shock that you're going to have to suffer through, you know? Uh, John C. used to say it all the time. Where do where we go? Who do we go with? And what the hell do we do when we get there? If you don't drink anymore. If you're withdrawing from a downer, alcohol, 24 to 48, 24 to, um, hours to seven to nine days, depending on alcohol, 24. Benzos, seven to nine days. Um, uh, barbiturates, seven days. Lasts for three days to 28 days, depending on the drug. And downer withdrawal is uh, signified by um, temperature fluctuations, hot and cold sweats, anxiety, palpitations, sleep disturbances, the shakes, hallucinations, seizure. And with alcohol, uh, delirium tremens, which could possibly cause death. Uh, the the, the, the fatal withdrawal symptom is delirium tremens. It happens with alcohol. If it's a stimulant, upper, remember that the direction of the drug withdrawal will be in the opposite direction. So you'll have a crash, lethargy, fatigue, muscle aches and pains, and depression. The depression, unfortunately, severe enough to precipitate suicide. Post-acute withdrawal, now you're finished with the shaky part. Uh, how, how long? Nobody knows. The problems inc include agitation, motor restlessness, aches and pains, anxiety attacks, so you look like you're having anxiety. There are some days that I call them bad chemistry days. You just wake up and you go, Arr, and somebody says, what's wrong? And you say, nothing. I just feel shitty. That's post-acute withdrawal. Diminished concentration, you find it difficult, you know, to concentrate. You read the top part of a paragraph, get to the end, and you've forgotten what the first sentence was. Terrible. And the return of dreaming. Sometimes you dream about drinking. Post-acute withdrawal uh, include dry drunks. You act drunk, but you are not physically intoxicated. You act like a drunk, demanding, resentful, angry, not staggering and falling down emotionally like a drunk. Emotional augmentation, you still have those times in which if you're given a stress three, you experience a stress three as if it were a stress seven. So the stimulus is only this much before the reaction feels much more intensified than the actual cause. Um, fear. Fogged thinking, hypersensitivity, self-consciousness, memory problems may go on for a period of time. Memory problems could become uh, chronic. In other words, your, your short-term memory especially is shoddy. The old timers used to call it itching because uh, nerve cells are coming alive, especially if you've been drinking a lot for a long time. And you might experience that as itching in your extremities. And they used to call it the whiskey fleas. Mood liability, that means you'll feel fluctuations up and down over the course of a day or a week or, or a month. Uh, feel good one point and not so good the next point. Kind of obsessive, ruminating, checking, compulsive checking. You think you've forgotten something. Um, your, your attention span is diminished. And, uh, so you're finding it difficult to stay fixed on a task for a period of time. And then that third kind of withdrawal, which includes uh, um, grief. I mean, you've lost uh, a loved one. You've lost a drug. And your relationship, that drug has been a love relationship. And so you will experience something akin uh, to grief, as in grief of the death of a loved one. So at first you kind of feel numb, uh, then uh, guilty, and then resentful, and then empty, and then feeling a poignant sense of pain, and then of course finally going on with life and realizing that you've lost something you've loved, and you reconcile to it, and you move on. That third kind of withdrawal involves awakening to the consequences 
I mean, you've got some consequences. Children who no longer love you very much, and indebtedness, a house that's a mess, uh, a job that's hanging by a thread. There are continuing struggles with denial. Uh, that denial system awakens. Uh, you, you wonder, you've been basing a sense of your identity on a sense of uh, analyzing a drug subject. So you've based your identity on a, a drunken subject. And so you awaken to wondering, who am I really? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I'm extroverted or introverted. I'm not sure uh, whether um, I am uh, a conversationalist or not. I'm, I'm, I'm just not really certain about my personality and its structure. You ask, without alcohol, what's life's purpose? And where do you go? And who do you go with? And what do you do when you get there? What do normal people do? How do they spend a weekend? What do they play cards? Is that what we're supposed to do? So it's not easy. Inhibition, you become inhibited and self-conscious. I mean, you've been having sex under the influence for 10 years. So guess what? normal, undrug sex feels like. Awkward, difficult, uh, embarrassing. Uh, and if you lose both the drug and the sex, at the same time, you're going to say, shit, this is no fun. And it's a, uh, unfortunately, we don't talk about it enough, uh, the path that um, diminished interest in sex and diminished sexual activity has in relapse. And then the shock of feeling again. Uh, sometimes it's for the first time in a long time. I mean, sober anger. Wow. Uh, sober, even, even the pleasant feeling, sober love sometimes feels a little awkward and unusual to, to have that kind of feeling. Welcome to early recovery. There's a disease in which alcohol blurs reality and you have to deal with a more painful reality because of drinking, seen more vividly because of abstinence. Your feelings are blurred, blunted, scary, and confusing, and yet you have to deal with a double dose of feelings because you don't have normal feelings. You have alcoholics in denial feelings. So you've done a lot more shit than most people have done to feel guilty. And those feelings are not just felt normally, they're augmented. So they're, they are felt more often and more intensely than most people. This is early recovery. Welcome to it. You have a diminished capacity to deal with stress, and yet you have more stress to deal with, with no coping skills. And what makes life special is gone and yet it seems that the world just decided to convince you that weekends were made for Michelob. You say, holy shit. All of a sudden they decide that we can't go through a weekend without drinking. Okay? And, and that's, that's, that's early recovery. So the objective of early recovery is to get through it. What's the object? Get through early recovery. Get time under your belt. How? It's the motive is to save your life. This is a life-threatening disease. So getting through re early recovery is about saving your life. That's why you're doing it. Oh, it's not to be a nice person. Save your ass. And the method is any way that works. If you find that tap dancing on street corners while chewing gum will keep you from taking a drink, Get your goddamn tap shoes on and go out there and do some tap dancing, all right? And chewing some gum. If that'll work, that's what I'd suggest you do, all right? Do whatever will keep you from pouring alcohol through the hole in your face, from injecting heroin into your vein, from snorting cocaine uh, up your nose. What, in fact, works best for most is Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. So I'd suggest you go do that. Why? Because it works. It works. It's available, it's free, and it works. 
Now, if we were to tell you there are two ways to go. One is unavailable, expensive, and unpredictable. The other is available, free, and works. What would you, cho what would you choose? <laughs> now, you say to the patient, that's AA. And they'll say, well, I'm not that sick. God, that's perverse. <laughs> it's available, it's free, and it works. I'm not like those kind of people. Bullshit, you're, like, you're exactly like them. Why? I always look at this audience, and you know what you look like to me, don't you? You look like an AA meeting. I swear to God, if you went to AA, these are the kind of people you would see sitting there in that room, exactly like you as an audience. So I, I would say go, go give that a shot. If it's a free and it's available and it works, I'd say that's something you probably ought to try to do.